you are listening to ISL Slen podcast featuring a wide range of conversations on diverse engineering and non-engineering sectors of national importance. I am Engineer Suran Fernando and today for our 10th podcast we have a special guest. Today our discussion is on the power generation strategy of the country which is a hot topic discussed and argued in many engineering circles nowadays. For that discussion we have engineer Lakshita Veera Singh who is the head of the CEB long term planning. Let me warmly welcome engineer Lakshita Veera Singh for today's discussion. Um, thank you ISL for uh, considering me and inviting me for this podcast. Well I I hope I would be able to do justice uh, to you uh, in the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes to come. Well There is a lot of discussion in the society these days about generating electricity using renewable energy sources. Judging by certain criticism in the society on the main electricity supplier, Ceylon Electricity Board, it appears that CB is not holding the same view on the role of renewable energy. As the head of CB's long-term planning branch, what are your views on relying more and more on renewable energy sources? to meet our future electricity requirement well that is a good question uh, in fact we also hold the same view as those in the society that we should gradually transition into a greener cleaner future and gradually abandon fossil fuels it is very clear that the entire world is moving in this same direction and uh, unlike during any other period in the past uh, we even see that the required associated grid support infrastructure and enabling technologies also coming up for us to make this transition you know that means uh, we can certainly rely on renewable forms of energy to meet our future electrical requirement uh, as a result uh, you know we are fully in agreement to the general view in the society that the country should gradually relieve itself from the dependency on imported fossil fuels and go for indigenous renewable forms of energy uh, in fact if you go by our recent long term generation expansion plans including the recent most draft long term generation expansion plan prepared for the period uh, 20 year period uh, starting from next year 2022 to 2041 also is clearly aiming at taking the country in that direction you know for example the latest draft long term generation plan had not identified any coal fired plant after 2030 it had identified only a single new coal plant of 300 megawatt size as compared to nine in the current plan that had received the approval of the public utilities commission so we planned it that way despite coal being the cheapest source of thermal generation because coal steam technology does not operationally complement the requirements of when running a system with large proportion of variable renewable energy sources so uh, it is clear we two are heading for the same goal in the same direction if that is the case why is there some criticism about cb some claim that cb is reluctant to go for renewables well i don't think there is any reluctance on the part of the cb the criticism i think is more about the strategy adopted by cb in reaching carbon neutrality and what is expected from us by the others you know you must understand that we have a responsibility to keep the lights on while also listening to these multiple drivers of the society including the government as a result our strategy of reaching for this low carbon future which is of course is based on years of experience we have in operating our power system and in seeing practical limitations in executing projects in the country is obviously different to what is expected from us by the others i think it is mainly to do with the speed that we see as optimal and practical as against what some others think than anything else mhm what is cb strategy then can you explain to our audience it is very important to know from the cb itself as it is the main electricity utility provider in sri lanka let me explain you know in order to understand what should be the correct strategy and uh, what should be the correct speed at which renewable sources are to be added into the system one must have a little basic understanding about how power systems actually work 
you know as we all know from the day we decided alternating current or ac in short as the best choice to transmit and distribute electricity we have inherited what is known as a synchronous power grid with synchronous generators running in synchronism supplying the customer demand in such a grid the supply of electrical power you know it's measured often in megawatts must be exactly equal to the demand for electrical power in real time if this supply and demand balance is not maintained in real time megawatt to megawatt that affect the system frequency and the system frequency is maintained within a very narrow and tight band for example uh, when frequency deviates just 3 hertz from the nominal of 50 hertz the power grid could actually collapse and that too within seconds so what is that got to do with renewables uh, if we are to go with very high proportion of renewables now we have to rely on solar photovoltaic and wind technology to take us there you know you know that all our hydro potential has been already exploited and we all know that solar and wind has varying and intermittent outputs unless we take corrective action in conventional power systems maintaining the supply demand balance was not a big problem as the only things that were changing were on the demand side or on the customer side the power system operators uh, you know power system operators are the engineers who are at national grid control centers like our own system control center at sri jawadanpura and centrally operating and dispatching the grid connected generators and of course they also operate the high voltage transmission network so those system operators uh, adjust conventional generators that they have at their control and match the demand sometimes this is called load following but now they have an additional problem in addition to the customers even some of the generators they have now are changing as a result they now have customers who change their demand minute by minute and generators like wind and solar who to change their output minute by minute so now maintaining the supply demand balance must be done by very few remaining conventional synchronous generating units whose share also should now gradually come down also to give way for the renewables like solar and wind so that is a problem Right, that is one problem. Uh, you know, I I told you earlier that in uh, in synchronous power grids, the supply demand balance must be maintained megawatt to megawatt in real time. Actually, system operators do not intervene to maintain this balance in seconds to millisecond scale. It is taken care of by the stored kinetic energy in the generators mainly. So, when customers suddenly ask for more electrical power in the next second. or start using less power than in the last second it is the stored kinetic energy that gets converted to electrical power in the generators before the prime movers that are coupled to the generators right i i hope all engineers listening know what i am talking about it can be the prime mover can be a turbine or a engine uh, start giving mechanical power back to the generators so that is the nature of synchronous power systems so when kinetic energy changes the generator rotational speeds changes and generator speeds are directly related to the frequency of supply and as a result frequency changes that means when the mechanical inertia of all the generators is high there is a lot of kinetic energy uh, and that kinetic energy can take care of sizable uh, supply demand imbalance without causing a significant change to the speeds of frequency but when the mechanical inertia is low there is a higher change to the speed that is required to give the same kinetic energy and as a result the frequency can be affected so when the conventional generators gradually give way to solar and wind the mechanical inertia to become low and low both wind and solar technologies have power electronic interfaces and does not add any mechanical inertia sometimes you may think that these big wind uh, turbines when you see the rotating blades they add mechanical inertia no they don't because their their interface is power electronics so 
same with solar. So, so, so we expect the mechanical inertia of our future power systems to get lower and lower. And that means a more and more unstable grid and we have to take corrective action for that. So as a result, CEB strategy to low carbon future also is addressing such technical problems on its way. Or else we could, you know, inherit a cleaner, greener grid, but with blackouts and brownouts. So you mean to say that it is the technical problems that keep us from making the transition faster? That means CB engineers have failed so far to give proper solutions to those problems? Isn't that the case? I'm really glad you phrased the question that way. In fact, a lot of people think so. And my answer is definitely not. You know, technical problems have technical solutions. Engineering problems have engineering solutions. It is not the lack of solutions, but it is other practical limitations in implementing such solutions and also certain very important other strategic reasons that had actually compelled the CEB to propose its own pathway to the greener grid. You know, one must understand that it must not only the energy sources that must be sustainable, but our progression to renewable itself must be sustainable. It is those reasons that keep CEB2 from taking the very rapid, you know, near overnight transition that lot of people are advocating now. Now, now, you are saying about some limitations other than the technical problems that you mentioned earlier. Can you please share with us what those are? Initially, you said that it is the technical challenges that you are more concerned of. Let me put it like this. Uh, there are three important considerations in deciding the optimum pathway the country must take to green grid. It is very important for our country to have our own pathway, have our own strategies in going for the green grid. We must not merely follow what other countries are doing, but must take our own strengths and weaknesses and national priorities into consideration and devise our own strategies to come up with the best pathway. Right. So, as I told you before, there are three considerations. First consideration, there are challenges that we have to overcome on the way. There are three challenges in my opinion, uh, which I will explain later. And mind you, only one of those challenges is the technical challenge. And technical challenge is the smallest of the three challenges, though many think it is the biggest. So many try to teach us technical solutions and fun even fundamentals of power systems thinking that our reluctancy to go faster is in fear of such technical problems. But, you know, contrary, though technical challenges is also a great concern, no doubt, right? So, they are, they are a concern. But in comparison to uh, the other two challenges, it is the smallest of the three. So, facing such challenges is the first consideration in deciding our own path to low carbon future. The second consideration is that there are very important benefits also that is available for us to gain or reap during the journey to maximi maximize renewables. You know, going for renewables is not only about reaching a target by such and such a date. We must make the country also benefit not only by merely reaching the goal, but also during the transition. See, there are a lot of benefits available which we are likely to miss if we unduly rush. You know, I will explain very briefly later. So that is consideration number two, the benefits. We must consider the benefits. The third consideration in deciding our own pathway, like what CB had done, is that there are very important corrections and adjustments that we definitely require to make during our journey. If we simply try to jump from today to a target in say 2030, we are most likely would not be able to make those corrections and adjustments on the way. I will try to explain very briefly, but it's quite impossible for me to explain everything in a short chat like this, Suran. You know, the world around us is changing very rapidly and there are very important new developments in the field of firing that we are seeing coming up. Very promising and very interesting. So even now we see clearly different directions leading to the same end result of all this all, end result of this uh, all renewable future. Right? There are different directions that we could take to go to the same end result. So unless we are very careful and try to go rapidly, 
but in small steps, right? That, but in small steps, we will not be able to make these corrective actions and adjustments. So CME's approach is to go in small steps, but rapidly. So you must understand that going for the all renewable future is not only about installing n number of solar parks and x number of wind parks. A lot of people think like that and mainly influenced by the commercial lobby. So, but we see a lot of other opportunities we as a country must take a note of and try to adapt during this uh, journey rather than simply, you know, putting up solar and wind parks. Can you please elaborate the three considerations that you mentioned? If I get it right, I think they are first the challenges, the second the benefits and third the adjustments. So can we start from the challenges? There are three challenges technical, financial and implementational. Of course, they are all coupled to each other. Uh, for example, if we try to achieve say 70% of electricity generated by 2030 from renewables, as I told you earlier, we have to rely on solar and wind to take us there. right? And both these technologies, particularly solar, has low run factors. That means to get the same equivalent energy of a let's say for example 300 megawatt liquid natural gas fired power plant running at 70 percent plant factor if you are to get the same energy from solar we need about 1000 megawatts of solar as against 300 megawatt from LNG plant this is a big problem you see solar generates very high power capacity during a short period of the day to give the same energy now our transmission network must be capable of transmitting this high power it must be rated to transmit 1000 megawatts instead of 300 megawatts to evacuate power from the solar plant as per my example to get the same equivalent energy to evacuate power from solar and wind zones which are you know positioned right around the country we now need a very high capacity 400 kv backbone transmission line network connecting our load centers with these renewable energy zones right now our backbone network is 220 kv but in order to transmit these high power capacities, we cannot rely on 220 kV. So we have to upgrade to 400 kV. This is both a financial challenge and, and as well as an implementational challenge, which is very, very difficult to achieve. You know, as per very preliminary estimates we have made so far, it is our estimate that we will require an additional 1.7 billion US dollars to invest on the transmission infrastructure. That is, that is required before 2029, if we are to achieve a target in 2030. Again, we also need to maintain the supply-demand balance every second, as I told you earlier. But now, solar brings in more power than required by the customers in real time. Right? I hope you can visualize now. So, as per the simulations that we have done, if we are to achieve 70% of generation from solar and wind by 2030, that will require over 1000 megawatts of batteries to be installed by that time to take the excess generation that is coming from solar and wind uh, during uh, daytime. Batteries are still only emerging technologies. There was a lecture recently where it was told that the total installed battery capacity worldwide is still less than 2000 megawatts, right? I don't know, but this is what it says. But here we too require 1000 megawatts when the world over is still is having about less than uh, 2000 megawatts also battery prices though rapidly falling are still high so as per the present battery cost batteries will also require about 2 billion us dollars within the period uh, uh, 2025 to 2029 mostly so there is a big financial problem for the country you see unlike conventional thermal plants where the costs are spread over 25 years. So initially you have the capital cost and thereafter the operational cost, the fuel cost, it spreads over 25 years. But for solar and wind, true, they don't need any fuel. So they generate electricity without any, any cost during the operational period. But for solar and wind, the cash outflows are mainly upfront. So can the country afford to do so amidst the present forex problem? Well, I don't know. The third biggest uh, a challenge is the implementation of challenge. For example, if you have to achieve 70% from renewable energy by 2030, we need about 400 megawatt of solar PV on average per year from next year onwards. If we realize only half of that using solar parks, right, the rest can be 
using a rooftop or whatever means like let's say we we half of that is realized using large parks so that means we need two 100 megawatt size solar parks constructed every year from next year so mind you we do not have a single 100 megawatt solar park in the country and to just to purchase land to the first 100 megawatt solar park at Siemalandua, the Sustainable Energy Authority is struggling since 2013, since 2017. So it is not their fault. That is how things happen in this country. In addition to solar, once in every two years, we need three MENA wind park size wind parks of 100 megawatt size. We need three of them developed in the country. With the sort of implementation difficulties in the country, is it possible? Well, I will let the audience to ask that question. Our view is merely raising a target alone will not make anything. So that is why when engineers say that something is, yes, it is possible, it must be possible both technically and practically. You see, we are not scientists or academics or visionaries. You, you know, you, they have the liberty to state anything they foresee as possible. But we are engineers and remember, as I told you at the beginning, we have a responsibility to keep the lights on also. So that is why when, when we say yes, something is possible, it has to be possible both technically as well as practically. Looks that we came to the interesting part of the discussion. But since we are running out of time, Engineer Lakshita, can I ask you to quickly let us know the other two considerations, the benefits and the third, the adjustments you think as required. The journey to renewables must be made in such a way that it also breeds local industry, local entrepreneurship also. Our country does not have a big market to support large industries like, like automobiles. Right? Our, our market size is small. But if you take the power sector, it is sizable to support the growth of new players, new industries compared to other, other opportunities. We already see that Sri Lankan business enterprises that entered into mini hydro industry and even wind industry now operates very successfully even overseas. Same with certain companies that carried out EPC contracts for thermal power plants like our own Laka Transformers Limited, our subsidiary. They now even operate in Bangladesh. So there are very successful local companies that have invested in wind power also. Right? So we must make this journey in such a way that local players uh, both new small players and also those who are already experienced to come and do the development of RE so that they get benefited from the opportunity. To do so, we must go gradually big with a mixed model. But if you simply rush to a very high target, you will soon see that the big international companies are coming and doing the development. It is only such big international players who can engage in developing 100 megawatt 200 megawatt, 300 megawatt, even 500 megawatt size development. And our companies, we Sri Lankans will miss the opportunity to develop the small scale industrial players capable initially to engage in smaller sizes like 1 megawatt, 10 megawatt, they have to go to 20 megawatt. So we miss the opportunity of developing them. It is them who later on stepping, step on to 20 megawatt, 100 megawatt size go overseas and that is how businesses develop in a country. So if we rush unduly, we also would see these international companies coming in also asking for dollar denominated tariffs, right? You take a very careful note on this. If you unduly rush, it is the only big players who can come and take the challenge and they will ask for dollar denominated tariffs. In such an eventuality, we would not only would be able to develop our own business sector, but also we will have to pay electricity produced by our own solar and wind resources back in dollars. So, is it any different to generating from imported fossil fuels? I don't know. You know CEB plans had already offered very big opportunities to solar and wind industry. For example, as per the draft CEB generation plan, we have planned to add over 2000 megawatts of solar by in 2029, which is about five times what we have in the country right now. So that itself is a massive opportunity to the local business sector. I do not have time to let you know what are the adjustments we need as it takes time for me to explain. But let me summarize the CEB pathway to low carbon future in just one uh, statement. We intend to go from high carbon electricity, if I may call it brown grid, because now right now uh, 
if even though i call it high carbon electricity our uh, uh, carbon dioxide in a single kilowatt hour in the electricity that we produce is only 0.55 kilograms of co2 which is quite low by the world standard but let's call it the brown grid or high carbon grid so if we intend to go from uh, this brown grid initially our plan is to initially go via a blue grid right from brown to blue that uses liquid natural gas as a transition fuel that is why i told you at the beginning we have stopped generating new coal power plants after 2030 so it will be mainly lng as a transition fuel to the green grid of the future so our proposal is to do so via successive generation plans from brown to blue to green but not just within one plan but in successive generation plans that we would prepare once in every 2 years so that we can adjust to new developments and practical challenges on the way so our plan is to make our grid zero carbon ready first before we make the jump but if we simply try to take a big jump you know sometimes thinking it is very attractive to have such policies and slogans without realizing the bigger picture well i think what would happen your guess is as good as mine that is the only thing i have to say thank you yes those are the views of engineer lakshita veerasinghe who is the head of long term planning at cb let us conclude this fruitful discussion now Thank you very much engineer Lakshita Veer Singh for spending your valuable time to share your ideas opinion your strategy on the CB's path towards renewable energy we wish you all the success in your future endeavors thank you uh, once again for giving me the opportunity to brief ISL membership on this uh, very quite pertinent subject and also i take this opportunity to wish you uh, all good success on your future endeavors and with the slide thank you thank you very much this is engineer suran fernando from slend podcast have a nice day